Well, that's an interesting thought. Have you had a Gethsemane? Some of you may have had one recently or going through a difficult time even right now. And uh, I pray that this message will uh, encourage you, encourage us all on this day. Go ahead and be finding our text in 2 Thessalonians. And I want to read this passage to you where the Apostle Paul is trying to clarify or clear up some confusion regarding some end time events. And in the process of doing so, he mentions uh, kind of a mystery man in the Word of God who will one day become a worldwide ruler or dictator over all of the nations. And so I want you to notice what Paul says here in this uh, unique and unusual passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception upon or among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, last Sunday, of course, was Easter Sunday. Sunday before that was Palm Sunday. And so we looked at each one of those Sundays and, of course, the resurrection of Christ. Um, but if you've not been with us this spring, we have been studying the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And to me, it's kind of like uh, being out at Panama City Beach. Beautiful beach, but you can walk out so far uh, knee-deep, and then, uh, I mean, you can go out a long way knee-deep, and then your next step, you're about 15 foot in water, and you swim a little bit, about 10 yards or so, and then you're about ankle-deep again. And the Apostle Paul, as he's dealing with things like the tribulation and he's dealing like, uh, with things like the rapture, there are times that he really steps off into some deep water. And so that's kind of where we are this morning. And these first two verses, as I read them and thought about them, it kind of took me back to my college days. I remember uh, a beautiful sunny day, and I was taking a break on the campus there and was resting and reading my Bible and sitting on the ground and leaning my back uh, against a huge Florida pine tree about this big. And all of a sudden, this man came walking up to me. I didn't know him from Adam. I just assumed he was another college student. But he could see that I was reading my Bible. And so our conversation very quickly turned towards the Word of God. We started talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and His return. And theologically, we were in total agreement with one another until... He made this unusual statement. He said, well, you know that the Lord has already returned from heaven, that he returned to earth about 10 years ago, he said, and the Spirit of the Lord has embodied this particular man, and he called a man by name, who, by the way, is now deceased. But uh, anyway, he said there are thousands, there are tens of thousands of us that are following this man now, we believe that he's the Lord that has returned, and I'm just walking around campus sharing the good news that Christ has come back. He's among us, and we've got a special meeting tonight, and I'm inviting people to come and learn more about all of this. That's exactly what he said to me. And you can imagine how stunned I was, to say the least. Here I am, just a young college student, teenager, 19 years of age, 
small town USA, Lake City, Florida, and uh, when he finally shut up, I spoke up, and I grabbed my Bible, and I turned over to Matthew 24. It's what I was thinking of the whole time he was talking there towards the end. I just felt sorry for him. Here's a man that literally is deceived, saturated with ignorance, and so I read to him from uh, Matthew 24, and I tried to help him understand that he was following one of these false Christs that Jesus was warning us all about there in Matthew 24. And so um, that takes us to our text this morning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul left the city of Thessalonica, the church that was there. He headed on down to the city of Corinth. But there were those that were in Thessalonica that were troubling the believers in that church. Paul mentions that in verse 2. They were being disturbed. They were literally being shook or shaken, he says, either by someone physically in person, like a false teacher, like the man that approached me that day on the campus uh, there of the University of Florida, or if not physically in person, Paul mentions perhaps in verse 2 it could have been a false letter or a counterfeit epistle supposedly from him. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why he penned these closing verses of this letter in his own handwriting. He says that in chapter 3, verse 17. Paul had an eye problem. He wrote very big, he says, to some of the churches. And so they would recognize his unique, uh, distinct handwriting and it would authenticate that this letter was truly from him. And you'll remember that Paul had already told them back in his first letter, 1 Thessalonians, that the people of God, Christians, would be spared from the wrath that would come one day on the earth. He says that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, meaning the wrath of God's judgment during seven years of tribulation that would happen on the earth. Paul is saying that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be caught up to heaven. Remember that? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, before all of those horrible things began to happen on the earth. My men's group the other morning, we were meeting at uh, the Chick-fil-A, and uh, we were, somehow we got on the subject of the rapture. And we made the point that the rapture would be before the tribulation, seven years of tribulation. So it would be pre-tribulational. And one of the men spoke up and he said, Pastor, I am so pre-tribulational, I don't even like to eat post-cereal, he said. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but these Christians here in Thessalonica, let me put this in context. They were facing some intense persecutions and tribulations. Paul mentions that back in chapter 1, verse 4, 5, and 6. So put all this together. These people are going through tribulation, and they have these false teachers now, either by in person or by letter, saying that the Lord has already returned. And with all the persecution and tribulation they're facing, they're thinking that they have missed the rapture and they're going through this tribulation period even right now. They're very confused. And so Paul understands this. And very much like a shepherd, like a pastor, very lovingly he says to them, do not let anyone deceive you because, he says, before the Lord is revealed from heaven one day with his mighty angels and flaming fire, that's 1 Thessalonians 1, 7, he says there are two key things that must happen, first of all, on the earth. First of all, this apostasy or falling away, he says in verse 3. In other words, the great rebellion against God. But then secondly, the revealing or unveiling of this man who is known in Scripture as Antichrist or the Antichrist. That's the title that the Apostle John gives in uh, 1 John chapter 2, in referring to this satanic superman, Paul simply calls him the lawless one. You notice in verse 8 and verse 9, the son of perdition or destruction, the man of sin, verse 3. There are many titles that are given to this character throughout Scripture. Uh, in Daniel, he is called uh, the prince who is to come or the little horn. Uh, John in uh, Revelation 13, Revelation 19 refers to him as the beast. And there are more than a hundred verses in the Bible. Again, in Daniel, the book of Revelation, 1 John, obviously 2 Thessalonians, that speak of the character and the career of Antichrist and his kingdom and crushing defeat one day in Revelation chapter 19. 
And yet, he will for a short period of time actually rule the planet. He'll be as head of a one world government, a one world religion in which he declares himself to be God. Paul is talking about that in verse 4. And he demands that everyone on earth at that time bow down and worship him. In fact, if we are living in the last days, and we talk a lot about that, I've had people ask me, Pastor, do you think this man, Antichrist, could be alive even right now? And my answer is yes. Uh, absolutely. He could have been born 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Gary Frazier, a Christian author, writes about this very possibility. Let me read to you what he says. He says, quote, Somewhere at this moment, there may be a young man growing to maturity. He is in all likelihood a brooding, thoughtful young man. But inside of his heart, however, there's a hellish rage. It boils like a cauldron of molten lead. Because he hates God, he despises Jesus Christ, he detests the church. And in his mind, there is taking shape the form of a dream of conquest. He will disingenuously present himself as a friend of Christ and of the church, Yet he will, once empowered, pour out hell itself onto this world. Now, can the world produce such a prodigy, he asked. Well, Hitler was once a little boy. Stalin was a lad at one time. Nero was a child. And the tenderness of childhood will be shaped by the devil into the terror of the Antichrist. End of quote, he says. Now, that prefix, anti. It can mean to be against something, to be opposed to something, or it can also mean instead of or in place of. And if you think about it, that fits the enemy, the adversary, Satan to a T. He has always had that M.O. He has always not only been diabolically opposed to God, the Word of God and the will of God, but he also is desirous to be worshipped instead of God or in place of God. And he, this man, Antichrist, is Satan's pawn and prodigy to be used in an attempt to accomplish Satan's will during the end of time, during the tribulation period. And the Antichrist will not only be opposed to Christ, but Scripture presents this man as opposite of Christ, as you might imagine, in every conceivable way. And we'll put some things on the screen to give you an example. For example... Whereas Christ is the good shepherd, right? That's Psalm 23, John chapter 10, verse 11. The Antichrist is known as the foolish shepherd in Zechariah 11:15. Whereas Christ is exalted on high, Antichrist will be cast down eventually into the lake of fire. And as Christ is always about the Father's will, this Antichrist is always about doing Satan's will. Whereas Jesus Christ humbled himself, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, the Antichrist seeks to exalt himself. And in the Bible, Christ is the Holy One, he's the Lamb. The Antichrist is the lawless one, Paul says. He's the beast in Revelation 13 and 19. And Jesus is the man of sorrows, that's Isaiah 53. The Antichrist is the man of sin, Paul says here in chapter 2, verse 3. Jesus is the Son of God. The Antichrist is the Son of Destruction. Jesus cleansed the temple. We talked about that last uh, Sunday, I believe it was. The Antichrist one day will desecrate the temple. Whereas Jesus is God, Antichrist merely claims to be God, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 4. And Jesus is the Lion of Judah. Antichrist has a mouth like a lion, Revelation 13, 2. And of course, Jesus is a part of the Holy Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Antichrist is a part of an unholy trinity of Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Now, I could give you at least 15 or 20 more contrast between the Lord Jesus Christ and Antichrist if we had more time. But uh, there are three things that Paul is saying here regarding this person that will one day uh, rule the world, be the dictator of the world, so to speak. So what are they? First of all, there is his, in other words, Antichrist, coming rise to power one day in the future. And Paul talks about that clearly in verse 6 here. He says, and now you know 
what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, capital H, is taken out of the way. Verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, he says. So for now, this personality is being restrained for the time being. And that word restrain, you see it in verse 6, you see it in verse 7. What does it mean? It means to hold something back, to hold something down. And most theologians believe that the he, capital H in verse 7, who now restrains the lawless one, is who? He is the Holy Spirit of God. And that's just a reminder to me that God is sovereign over all. Amen? I mean, you look at our world, and sometimes it looks like things are falling apart. Uh, I mean, my goodness, when there's an earthquake up in uh, New Jersey, you think, what on earth is going on? But there are times that you, it just looks like things are just going south. But we're reminded in Scripture not to fear, as Billy said a moment ago, but to have faith because God is sovereign. God is on the throne. There are times when it looks like maybe your life is falling apart. But God is not only the creator of life, he is the sustainer of life. And there's just simply a reminder here that Satan does not have full control of anything on this earth. He can only do what God permits him to do, what God allows him to do. And even when God allows him to do certain things, like you read in the book of Job, or in this case, when the church is removed from the world, and when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. And I want to talk about that for just a moment because that phrase in the end of verse 7 means the Spirit's restraining power is taken out of the way, but not His redeeming power taken out of the way. Because if His redeeming power is removed from this earth, nobody during the tribulation could be saved. And yet it's clear in the book of Revelation, that there will be some people who will be saved during the tribulation period. There'll be many Gentiles, John says in Revelation chapter 7. Now let me say this. If you do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not want to wait until that seven year of tribulation to humble yourself and come to know him because it will be a horrible time on the earth. All you got to do is read Revelation 6 through Revelation 18. It'll be a disastrous time. All kinds of judgment being poured out upon the earth. The seals that are broken, the, the uh, other things that are happening, it will cost you dearly. Believers and followers of Christ during that time will be persecuted, they will be martyred, they will be slain. A person cannot hold down a job or make any purchases at all unless they take that infamous mark of the beast. And if you're alive on the earth during that time, if you don't hear anything else, and I pray that that's not your situation, but if that is your situation, do not take the mark of the beast. That is the last thing you would want to do. But anyhow, beyond some Gentiles that will be saved during that time period, John makes it clear, Revelation 7, 1 through 8, that about 144,000 Jews will be saved as well. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to take the gospel to the nations. Jesus talked about that, Matthew 24, verse 14, before his literal physical return to this earth and judgment of the nations. The gospel has to go out to all of the nations. So you have this man of lawlessness, Paul says he's being restrained for now, for a time being, verse 6 and 7. But he will be revealed in time, verse 8. And then what happens? He says this apostasy, this falling away, this full-blown rebellion against God on earth will begin to unfold, he says in verse 3. Now, you may remember if you're a student of the Bible that Paul, as he's writing young Timothy, he talked about an apostasy in general that will happen during the last days. That's over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I think I've got that marked here. You remember this. He said, uh, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, 
unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, and on and on he goes there. That apostasy is really different from the apostasy that Paul is talking about here in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, there is a time where people, as we get closer to the, to the last times, that their hearts will be cooled. And uh, as I just read to you everything that Paul said to Timothy there. Our hearts were broken recently. My wife's heart, my heart, because we saw on social media where two young adults who were part of two different churches that I pastored through the years, both of these women are, I would say one is 28 and the other one is probably in her early 30s. And both of these women on social media, why people do this, I'll never know, but they said they're no longer believers or followers in Christ. And one of them said, she said, I, I'm, I'm an atheist. And I'm telling you, we're living in some of the most unusual days there is a fog of mist, of confusion and inclusion and delusion that is coming upon people like never before. I've never seen anything like it. There are people that are just so confused now. They don't even know their identity. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they are. And I really think it's just part of the times that we're living in. But Paul here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 is talking about the apostasy, not a apostasy, but the rebellion against God, led by Antichrist himself once the church is taken out of the way. Secondly, beyond his coming rise to power, there is his cunning rule one day over the whole planet Earth. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, Daniel, they all tell us a number of things about this uh, man. And for the sake of time, and this being the first Sunday of the month and Lord's Supper, uh, I'm just going to list off a few of these characteristics. We're going to put them on the screen. I don't have time to say a whole lot about them. And I pray you'll pardon my alliteration here. But anyway, first of all, it is clear from what Paul is saying that he is obviously a demon-possessed man. In other words, he is energized, he says in verse 9, by Satan himself. And the enemy always wants to try to copy God in some way. He always wants to counterfeit Christ, not in a good way, but in a bad way. He cannot pull off an incarnation, as Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. But what he cannot pull off, he will possess a man one day, wholly and fully. A man who, secondly, will have some diabolical powers. Again, he's energized by Satan himself to perform some amazing signs and wonders, some impressive stunts that are meant to thirdly deceive millions of people. And Paul calls these seemingly miraculous signs or stunts lying wonders, you notice in the end of verse 9. He doesn't just call them wonders or things that would amaze or astonish, but things that are falsely, deceptively leading people to false conclusions about who this man truly is. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, so he says there are lying wonders that he will do in verse 9. And then in verse 10, he goes on to say, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So this man, when he's on the earth, he's going to do some incredible signs, some amazing wonders to fool the world. You remember... Uh, I think of Pharaoh's ma magicians in the book of Exodus. And they were able to duplicate a lot of things along the way that Moses was doing. And of course, one of the most talked about miracles is his apparent assassination and resurrection back to life. That's Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. And again, Satan is always out to try to make a counterfeit Christ. Now, Jesus absolutely was crucified. He truly died. His lifeless body truly was buried, and he truly came back to life again. We talked about that last Sunday. We talk about that every Sunday. But Satan will attempt to copy that in some form or some fashion. I was thinking, I remember years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention was in Dallas, Texas. 
And one morning I woke up, this is about four or five years ago, and I left our hotel in downtown Dallas. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go try to find some decent coffee somewhere because the coffee in the hotel uh, was, uh, uh, well, anyway, it was not very good. But anyhow, so I'm looking for a Starbucks, and I've got it on my phone, and I, I, I'm walking, I turn a corner, and then I have this surreal experience because I know exactly where I am, though I've physically never been there before in my life. I'm in the exact place where President John F. Kennedy was assassinated about 60 years ago. I mean, it was surreal. I'm familiar with that in history. I looked up and I saw this six-story red brick Texas school book depository building right there. I knew exactly where my eyes should fall on the road, and sure enough, there's a white X that's painted there where his limousine was when, when the bullet hit him. And then I walked over to Dilly Plaza and the uh, grassy knoll, and it was, it was just unbelievable to be standing in this place that we've all heard about, this horrible history that took place in the United States. But could you imagine if Kennedy's body, 60-something years ago, with a mortal head wound, lying in state in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol, if suddenly the lid on that casket had popped open, and suddenly he sat up in the casket, and he began to speak to people. What an astonishing, amazing thing worldwide something like that would have been. And that's kind of what John is writing about in Revelation 13. He's talking about a slain man with a fatal head wound who suddenly miraculously will be healed and the whole world astonishingly is amazed and they're saying, who is like the beast? Who is like this man? Who can wage war with this man? This man is incredible. This man is our new leader from here on out. And so fourthly, he will be a definite solver of problems as well. He'll be a problem solver. He's a very charismatic leader with incredible oratorical skills to mesmerize the masses with his speech, speaking pompous, arrogant words, we're told in Daniel chapter 7. And many people years ago believed that Adolf Hitler was going to be the Antichrist with his Nazi war machine and his incredible command of the German language. In fact, Hitler once boasted that just as the birth of Christ changed the calendar, so his victory over the Jews would bring a whole new age to the world. And then he blasphemously said these words. He said, what Christ began, I will complete. Now, that's pretty pompous and arrogant right there. And here's a man who one day, we're told, is going to have all of the solutions to all of the mounting problems around the world, all of the financial problems of the nations. We said a couple of weeks ago, there are currently 19 nations in the world that are over a trillion dollars in debt, with our nation leading the way at $34.5 trillion. In fact, we're on pace right now as a nation to add a trillion dollars more debt every 100 days. It's unbelievable. And so these problems keep percolating. And so, I don't know, somewhere there's got to be an end to all of that. You just can't keep going on in debt. And, and you know, by the way, how much do we take in in revenue? It's tax time. Whether or not you know that or not, it's coming up April 15th. <laughs> how much do we take in revenue? I read the other day we take in $4.6 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money coming in. And yet Congress recently passed a new budget for over $8 trillion. It makes no sense. If you, if you live on $50,000, if that's your income, you cannot have a home budget of $500,000 for that year. I don't know. Maybe I should run for president. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> Antichrist is going to have all of these problems figured out. He's going to have the Middle East, Arab, Israeli problem figured out. In fact, that's another thing on our list here. Fifthly, he's going to be a delegator of peace in the Middle East with all of the Arab nations surrounding Israel. Dr. David Jeremiah writes the following. He says, the Bible, quote, 
predicts that worldwide chaos and instability and disorder will increase as we approach the end of the age. Jesus himself said that there'd be wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes in various places. And just before these tensions explode into world chaos, the rapture of the church will depopulate much of our planet. As many as 70 million people, he says, could suddenly disappear from our nation alone. And the devastation wrought by these disasters will spur a worldwide outcry for relief and order at almost any cost, and that will set the stage for the emergence of a new world leader who will, like a Pied Piper, promise a solution to all the world's problems. He will negotiate world peace and promise order and security. This leader who will emerge out of the newly formed European Union is commonly referred to in the Bible as the Antichrist. And things will appear very good for a while after this covenant of peace is signed, protecting the nation of Israel. But then Daniel says, at the three and a half year mark in the tribulation, the Antichrist turns out to be a deal breaker of all of his promises with Israel. And again, he is demon possessed. He's got a lion tongue a L-Y-I-N-G tongue uh, that's energized by Satan himself, who's the father of all lies. You know, we just went through April Fools, and people tell little, little lies there and have some fun along the way. Uh, just innocent fun, of course. Uh, my wife loves April 1st. She gets a lot of people. She got me by the end of the day and a few other people along the way. But you know one of the worst April Fool's jokes that I found about this year? Somebody took a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts to, to their office. And when you open that up, that's what you see on the inside. <laughs> now that's just wrong. <laughs> well... You say, what's your point in doing all that? Well, my point is, it's one thing to poke fun at people and uh, fool people. That's what April Fool's is all about. But Antichrist is not about April Fool's. He's about lying straight out. And he's about breaking his covenant, his promise with the nation of Israel. And then he becomes a demander of praise and worship by setting himself up or an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem to be worshipped by all the world as God, Paul says here in verse 4. Daniel talks about this in Daniel chapter 9. Jesus mentioned it in uh, Matthew 24, 18, and he called it the abomination of desolation that will occur one day in the temple in Jerusalem. And at that point, Antichrist becomes, eighthly, a deliverer of great persecution among many people on the earth. But Paul reminds us, praise God, he is also a doomed personality. In other words, his days are numbered, and his doom is already destined and predetermined. If you look at the rest of verse 8, Paul says, And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And we'll talk about that glorious event uh, one Sunday in May as Paul is talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me just move on here beyond his coming rise to power and secondly, his rule over the planet for time or for a season. Finally, there is his complete removal from the earth and his eternal punishment when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth one day. And again, we will talk about that uh, one Sunday in May. But I do want to read to you. John goes ahead, like Paul Harvey, he gives you the rest of the story. Revelation 19, verse 19 and 20. He says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, capital H, who sat on the horse and against his army, and then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, 
in other words, Antichrist and false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so that's kind of the short version right there of his demise. And again, we'll talk more about that in greater detail one Sunday in May. But isn't it good to know that as a believer in reading the last chapter of the book of Revelation, that you and I are on the winning team and that our foe, our enemy, is a defeated foe and you can be on the winning team. You remember when you were in school at playground? I used to kind of fear this, but they'd have two captains, and I was always small, and these captains would start picking teams. And my heart's desire, as your heart's desire, was what? To be on the winning team. Well, you can be on the winning team if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you more than you can ever even begin to imagine. He loves you so much he died in your place for all of your sins. And then he literally rose from the dead, proving that he and he alone is Messiah. And he provided the only way to have your sins and my sins completely forgiven, the slate wiped clean in our life. When you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, and if you've never done that, I pray that on this day, Today will be the day. Now, I want you to go ahead and take these elements. Get them in your hand. Get the bread there. And I'm going to give you a moment to pause and to pray and to prepare your heart to receive them. We're going to go a little bit over time here, but that's all right. Just take a moment. Prepare your heart, and I'm going to lead us here in just a second. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this day. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who, as we said, died for our sins and rose from the dead. And uh, help us celebrate his body and his blood here in this Lord's Supper. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we talked about the Passover meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. We talked about that back on uh, Palm Sunday a few Sundays ago. And then... In Matthew chapter 26, verse 17, we read this. Now, on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Jesus said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand, and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, when the evening had come, they sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, one of you will betray me. And they were all exceedingly sorrowful, and each man began to say to, to him, Lord, is it I? And then he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes, that is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And Jesus said to him, You have said it. And then verse 26 it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. You know, back in December of 2019, there was a man that posted a 45-second video on Twitter that since has gone viral. And it's a simple little video. It starts off, we've got a picture here. It shows a mother uh, bird that's seated on her nest out in the middle of a field, and her eggs are in that nest. And she looks in the distance, and she can see that a farm tractor is coming her way. 
And so she immediately kind of pulls up her wings like this. In the next picture, you can see that, and she's going to protect her little eggs that are there. The next slide, you see the tractor is right on top of her. And gratefully, the tractor went on through. I don't know if the man saw. I don't even know who's recording the video, but uh, the nest was not disturbed. The eggs were not uh, disturbed. The, the mother bird was not disturbed at all. But when I saw that, I thought, here's a little bird, frail as she is, but she was willing to sacrifice her own body for that which she loved. Well, Jesus Christ did that. He gave up his body on the cross for us. But not just his body, but his precious blood. This is a true story. In 2007, there were two injured and dying Iraqi soldiers that were brought to the U.S. triage center. One of those soldiers was bleeding so bad, they said that unless he got 30 pints of blood, he was not going to survive. So they put out a call there on the U.S. base and said to the soldiers, any of you men that have this blood type that want to donate blood to help this enemy soldier come and do so, well, a line of U.S. soldiers showed up to donate their blood. And as I thought about that, and of course the soldier lived, but here is this Iraqi soldier who was an enemy of these U.S. soldiers but they're giving their blood to save this man's life. And there was a time in our life, perhaps, when we treated God as if he were an enemy. And yet Paul says, even when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us that much. Even when we treated him as we ought not have treated him, we ought to have treated him as he is, the loving God that he is. But Jesus goes on to say here, it says in verse 27, He took the cup, He gave thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, I'm going to invite Josh to come back on back up here and lead us in a song. And we're going to sing. It's a time of invitation. In fact, I invite you to go ahead and stand to your feet even right now. Some of our ministerial staff are going to be down front to receive you if we can help you with any question that you may have. And while we sing this familiar song, you respond as God leads you and puts upon your heart. Let's sing. Mm -hmm. 